<laughs> Give it a second to be, um, <laughs> to kick into gear. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. We are live. Uh, hello, everybody in Facebook land. Yes, it's me again. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> I'm Mitzi Soretto, and I'm here to uh, welcome our contributor to, from the best new true crime stories, serial killers, our wonderful contributor, Vicki Hendricks, live from Florida with her friend. And, and who's this friend? This is Red. <laughs> I think he's leaving. No, he's just going to climb on my shoulder. <laughs> Uh, is Red like your your collaborator? <laughs> um, yes, unfortunately, he doesn't help much though. Doesn't doesn't pay the bills, sort of like my bear Teddy Tedaloo, just just uh, wants demanding snacks yeah, and pints and, then and steps on the keys now and then. So you never know. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the detriment of all your editors, right? Saying, what's this gobbly goop you're sending in? <laughs> just well, just blame Red. <laughs> That's a good scam. Is is Teddy there today? I thought maybe we could have some umbrella drinks, but. Oh, uh, yeah, he's over on the sofa. He's sort of annoyed because I don't give him any plugs in this because I'm too busy plugging this. <laughs> oh, okay. Red just knocked something down. All right, but he's gone. <laughs> I hope Red doesn't knock down the uh, webcam. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, um, anyways, I'm so glad to see you. And I actually, you you were my mojito buddy when I was in South Florida. We used to tear up, you know, Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood Beach and, and chill out on mojitos with the umbrellas. Yeah. <laughs> and umbrella. I, I guess that was a different kind of drink, but, you know. Whatever, they were all nice. <laughs> they they definitely were, and I've not had a mojito like that. And I've tried to make one. I have rum. I have a mint plant that's thriving. And I don't know. I I, I did it two years ago, and I'm like, this doesn't bear any resemblance to those mojitos I had with Vicky. <laughs> yeah, those were the best. I don't know how to make them like that either. No, no. Um, I have not seen you since you came with me to the Miami Book Fair International, and we all went out with um, Irvin Welsh, invited us for drinks after that, and, and we had mojitos. <laughs> wow, I'm trying yeah. to remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, I think, was in that, two, we 2011. We a bar down the street? Yeah, it was some very freezing cold bar in downtown Miami with, of course, the air con just turned to frigid temps, as, as, as it always is. <laughs> God, you'd think I would remember Irvine Welsh. I yeah, read some yeah. of his novels, and now it's, I don't remember. That's terrible. Oh, my I mean, God, that's bad. Really old, so. <laughs> well, that was a fun event anyways, and it sort of was a, it was a nice rounding off to the, to the uh, book fair. Yeah, book fair is great. I, yeah, well, I don't know if they're having one this year. I don't think. I doubt it. I don't know. Probably not. Yeah, so yeah. We have to plan too far in advance for that sort of thing. Yeah, I know. I've had uh, book signings canceled, especially over in Canada. Uh, they shut the borders, so it's not like I can just go over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I feel really persona non grata these days, you know, <laughs> sort of stuck. I can't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, like everybody. Uh, I know. Well, um, tell us a bit about the story you wrote a buxom bell her own story um this is particularly one of my favorites from the book and i you know everybody is my favorite i don't want to like have people say oh, you didn't like my story i love all the stories but this one was quite distinctive uh tell us a bit about bell your subject well bell um i doubt there are too many like her i think she might be number one for female serial killers because her total comes to at least 48 and most of them were men she did kill some of her own children i guess all of her own children um and other people's children uh it's not really sure which ones were hers and which ones uh she adopted whether she even had any that she gave birth to is questionable uh people were uh trying to get homes for their children in those days because you know no birth control have a baby every year and so it was really easy to go out and pick up a child and get you know get paid to keep it and then and supposedly she really loved children so she had um i don't know i think seven or eight not all at one time because they kept dying off unexpectedly <laughs> but um but 
mainly she was interested in killing men. I think, uh, and she was in Laporte, Indiana when she did this, but she came from Norway. Her sister helped her to move to Chicago. She got married there. Uh, he died, Mads Sorensen. Um, he was, uh, he had taken out some life insurance. There's, you know, a lot to this. And I think I put that in the, in the story, but uh, there was an overlapping day of the old insurance and the new insurance. And he happened to die on that very day. So she got double the life insurance money and was able to buy the farm in Laporte, Indiana. And from there, she married another guy, big scene of his death in my story too. Um, I can give you more details, but I'm just trying to give you the rundown on her um, life. And then she took in about, I don't know, the other, oh, I don't know, somewhere around 40 that she killed were probably between 2000, or sorry, 1901 and 1908 when she lived in the farmhouse. And she would attract um, boyfriends um, expecting to be husbands, expecting to put cash and down and be part owners of the farm. And uh, she wrote to the Scandinavian and uh, Norwegian newspaper. There were lots of Norwegians there around that time and they all wanted to feel they were back home. And, and she offered these kinds of things in her letters, her uh, pork and dumplings, her cream puddings, you know, Christmas like they used to have at home and all that. And she attracted them and they would come in and not go back out. So um, it was it was suspicious <laughs> for a long time. And seemingly she eventually got away with it. So, so, so in essence, she was sort of a, what the Lonely Hearts uh, ads were, were her uh, ways of yeah, finding she, victims. Yeah, lure them in and, and always told them to bring cash because she <laughs> didn't trust, trust banks and, you know, there could be problems there. And um, they went for it. I mean, she had so many that replied. You know, and then uh, she selected the ones with less family, you know, less people to check up on them. And they would just leave and come to her. And a few times people came looking for them. That's really what started uh, her to uh, get on to uh, the ending, really, of what seemed like her life. But she probably survived when she burned down the farmhouse because uh, the brother of one of her victims was coming to search for him and she knew it was gonna be trouble and and suspicions had been building. So it was time to get out. Yeah, well, I guess I, I guess it can't go on forever. Um, now, I, I don't wanna put you out on a limb, but what, what, what was her actual name? Do you, can you uh, pronounce it? Well, no, I'm just gonna pronounce it like I think. <laughs> Okay, you're not Norwegian. <laughs> um, her real name was Brunhild. Paul's debtors Storseth, yeah. but um, she changed it to Bell when she came to um, Chicago, or or maybe that was yeah. I think she did it by then, and it was Bella for a while. Then it became Bell, and Gunnis that was her second husband's last name. So that's really um, how she became known, and she was known to all her neighbors in Laporte as Bell Gunnis. Okay, okay, um, so. You did. A, uh, I mean, as everyone did plenty of research, but I mean, I know you really you, you were even like getting court records. If I, I seem to recall, you were getting uh, getting the writing to the court to get some documentation. Yeah, well, for this. There was the um, the coroner's inquisition. That was really the only primary source that I was able to get. I, you know, read several accounts of things and um, there are some series video pieces and um, you know other short books about her. Harold Schechter really did kind of the definitive version of Bell, and um, you know he doesn't tell you what happened to her either because nobody knows. But yeah. you know he has um, most of the facts that sound legitimate to me. I've seen other things, other places that just didn't seem as likely. So I really think 
you know, if you want to read more about her, that's the place to go. It's called um, Hell's Princess, I think. Bell Gunnis. Uh, yeah, Hell's Princess. I didn't write down the secondary title, so I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what was it? What was it about Bell that? Uh, what, what made you choose her out of all the serial killers out there? And you know, God knows there's enough of them, and they certainly get written about many, 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 many times. But what? What? Um, what drew you to Bell? Well, um, I just started to look at a list on Google of serial killers, females, because I thought you know those would be more interesting. Uh, I wish, well, I didn't wish, but some people had some connections to serial killers and I wished I had something, you know, more personal I could do with it, but I didn't. So although growing up, uh, we did have a, a murder of uh, three people in the yard and the house connected to our yard, um, but they never found out who did it and there, there's nothing to say about it other than to describe the grisly murder. So I couldn't do that. So anyway, I just thought that Belle Gunnis was a name I hadn't heard before and there wouldn't be much known about her because I didn't know of her, <laughs> but apparently there's pretty much known about her. And, um, but I chose her uh, to take a look and then she was just so interesting and over the top that, um, you know, I was immediately obsessed with talking about her and everything. That's all I talked about for a few weeks. Yeah, I, well, I know. I mean, true crime, it's, it's the, the work is incredible. I, I don't, if, if you've never written true crime before, I can, I can tell you it's a hell of a lot of work that goes into these pieces, whether it's a short story, or short piece or, yeah. or long form. It's, no, it's hardcore. It's true crime. And that's probably why I wanted to try it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I also felt, how am I going to write this without just taking what other people have said and putting it together, which is something that I taught students not to do for 35 years. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't bring myself to do that. So no, good, that's yeah. really why I did it in the, you know, the fictionalized manner, sort of the Truman Capote style, yes. of, you know, um, getting into their heads and creating, you know, scenes. Of course, uh, he could talk to the um, murderers and get information that way, which I was unable to do since Belle's been gone for a long time, even if she did outlive, you know, <laughs> the people that were after her. But, um, you know, I just felt that um, I couldn't do a good job in, in just putting together information. So, and it, it was fun, you know, and it was different for me knowing how it had to go because normally I'm making up how it's going to go. So, you know, I had a, a script kind of, although you could choose to go various ways with it, but still it, it was fun for a while. And then it just became work. Like it always does. <laughs> yeah, I know. Doesn't it? I know it's, it's so true. It's like, Oh God, is this ever going to be done? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, well, that's I, you. Are, you are actually the only person in the book that that did a more creative nonfiction approach uh, through in the in the tradition of Truman Capote. And uh, I, I think it works really well for this story because um, I, I felt like I was right there in her head. And, uh, you know, OK, she's a serial killer. She has a hell of a body count. We'll, we'll grant her that. But I. Um, I kind of felt after after I read the piece and and got into her head and 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 I I I've, I had a slightly different take on it, which I wanted to discuss with you. Um, I mean, it's not just so black and white. I mean, I got the impression, um, in a way, her killings were motivated by survival, a need to survive. Here's this immigrant woman with this farmhouse and these kids, whether they're her kids or kids that she's brought in to look after, and she has to eat and she has to feed them and she has to keep things going and you know all the crimes were motivated in a way to get this money from all these men yeah she um i actually went for <laughs> trying to make her sympathetic because you know the things that are written about her and that show her they they always just show her as greedy and yeah. you know horrible and and uh she was a very strong woman, apparently. It was said she could 
fling a 200 pound hog up on her wagon. And she was very formidable in appearance, apparently not, not a, a pretty woman either. And, and she had been very uh, mistreated. First of all, she grew up extremely poor in Norway and she had to go out and her main job was to pick up twigs to use for firewood. And she also had to milk cows and, and all that. And you know how cold it is. So she's always out in the cold and everything. Well, then she, um, you know, uh, finds this landowner's son who seems to be in love with her, or at least it, I made it that way. Um, he seemed to pretend to from just the bare facts that you get. Um, she got pregnant at 17 and then he kicked her um, until she had a miscarriage. He kicked her till she was nearly dead and left her and then she had a miscarriage and, and it took her a long time. She barely recovered. Her sister said she was not the same person and I, after that that she had been before. And some other people said that too. Most of things said about her though, were after the fact, because after she was, you know, found to be a serial killer, they went back and interviewed people. So I don't know if they would have said the same things, you know, at the time, or if thinking back, they're like, oh yeah, I see when she turned into that person. But this was what her sister said. Her sister also said she loved children and which would make sense that she would adopt them, even though she's portrayed um, by other people as being so greedy that she just took the children in in order to get the money and planned on killing them all along. I, I kind of doubted that. Um, to me, it seemed that she might have thought the world is so rough and they don't have a chance in it and she might as well send them to heaven as innocent young children. I mean, maybe I'm going too far here, but I don't see why that wouldn't be something that occurred to her. Even after, you know, after she's getting all this money because she's killing these men. And, um, you know, there may be some vengeance behind that also, besides the money, considering her, you know, experience at 17. Um, you know, it just, you know, she did like the money, but she still had to go out and slop those hogs and milk those cows. And so do everything on the farm sometimes by herself. It was far from an easy life. So she just, she had it very rough. And I just ended up thinking that, you know, she was kind of pushed into it. And yeah, only certain people are going to go that way. But I don't know. I, you know, I wanted to make her sympathetic. So I'm glad that you didn't feel that she was just a greedy hellion. No, I mean, when, when you, when you proposed her as a subject, I was just doing a quick Google search just to get an idea of who she was. It's exactly what you said. She was sort of portrayed as this hulking female monster, this, this hideous creature and, and bloodthirsty and just slaughtering men left and right. And, uh, you know, and after reading your piece, it, it just, to me, I just, I had a whole different take on it. And, and I, I mean, yes, there are some serial killers who are just plain, evil, horrid people. I mean, I don't I don't really think anyone would find anything positive to say about Ted Bundy, other than the fact he was attractive. Uh, and that's how he got his women, he got his victims. But um, uh, he, it just seems that Bell was shaped by her circumstances. And I actually didn't know, I, was, I, I wasn't sure how creative you were in the scene about how she had been pregnant and, this, and, her, and her, uh, her lover kicked her until she lost the child. I thought you perhaps created that, but uh, I, I see you didn't, no. so. No, that was um, a thing that really happened to her as told by her sister later. So yeah, so she had a rough start all the way around. And, and, you know, okay, I mean, you can take the other side and, you know, with all the bodies she hacked up and threw into burlap sacks and, you know, just buried in pieces mixed together. And, and you know, she gave them strychnine and, and that was probably terribly painful a lot of the times, although sometimes she gave chloroform first. So it, it didn't seem like she really wanted them to suffer. And, and she was used to slaughtering hogs. 
she actually learned that from her second husband. And I don't know, a hog isn't, I don't know if I really mean this, but to me, a hog, slaughtering a hog is not that different from slaughtering a human being. I mean, once the human being is dead, I can see if you're used to that, possibly, you could just, without really thinking too much, you could go ahead and cut it up. And it was so she wouldn't get caught. And um, she really probably didn't know what else to do with it, fed some of them to the hogs, most likely. And she did love her hogs and she loved her animals. Yeah, and that came so, out in the story, how she, yeah. she how she actually, it was heart-wrenching for her to have to to slaughter yeah, one of her animals. I didn't but it make was that up either. There's evidence that she loved her animals. See, I'd so, starve um, if I were in that situation. Nobody's dying. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just not going to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, I guess, I don't know. I, I want to see what it anyway, so now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've well, finally she, seen the light. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to portray her, you know, as just a one-dimensional character, I, I really think that's given her a short shrift. So yes. I'm glad I was able to develop her a little further and let people think about it anyway and, and not just have her as evil. Well, I think I told you in an email that um, I felt you were really onto something with this kind of work. To, I mean, to to write in this particular way. I mean, I I, I don't you know. I'll talk, I'll ask you in a bit about what you're working on now. But I feel like this is something you should really perhaps <laughs> follow. I, I just think you found some niche here that maybe you hadn't gone in that direction from your crime noir and all that. I don't know. I'm I'm just too lazy anymore. <laughs> I, We're all lazy, but we have really to do it. It's hard you know? to get me to write anything. I'll tell you. Um, you're the only person that has got me to write anything in. Oh, I don't know how many years. <laughs> and I, you know, I've been writing what I feel like writing, but then I take a six month break, and then I have to start <laughs> over because I don't remember what it's about. Yeah, and yeah. you know, it's so. <laughs> I don't think I'm ready to take on a, a new, you know, serial killer <laughs> um, portrait. <laughs> well, that, well, you know, I have a call for submission and submissions out right now. So with the, the well-mannered uh, crooks, rogues, and criminals, I think I sent that to you. Like hint, 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 Vicky. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I got to do mine too. And I'm like trying to find a subject. And I, I, I just, during this pandemic, I suddenly got this, this idea for a novel and I've got shelved projects that I've been wanting to get back to. And I don't know what I, I to just staying on the shelf and I, I'm really stuck into this one particular thing. So, I mean, I didn't expect that to happen, but it's like, well, you know, I'm going to have to um, focus on a subject and start the research and, and yeah, it really sucks you in the amount of time that it really oh, takes yeah. to, you know, it, yeah. whether it's 7,000 words, 4,000 words, or, or 80,000 words. Yeah, and then after you're finished, you always see something else and wish you would have put it in. And, you know, and you can't just cram in the facts there either, especially the way I was doing it. So I had to leave out so much. Yeah. But, um, and, and I have never, you know, written a novel under a deadline or um, because... I was supposed to do it for a publisher or anything. So I've really been spoiled and just written whatever I wanted to write. You know, all of my novels were just what I felt like writing at the time. And so I have written some, you know, short stories for people that, you know, were doing collections, but but it it's really, there's a fear factor there because I'm always afraid I can't get a good ending. And <laughs> I read, lots of short stories that they're supposed to be literary, but I'm not satisfied with the endings. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, they I call it literary. Like so you're real, supposed to excuse and, everything. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess in some people's minds that cheapens it if you have a real ending, but I don't care. I want a real ending. I usually want some irony there and, and I'm afraid I can't get that. So when I tell somebody I'll do a story for them, I want at least six months, which <laughs> you gave me, so that was good. Um, but, you know, and this was different too, but um, 
I just, you know, I'm in a panic. I start it right away and then I want to have time to let it sit around and so yeah. I can go back and have a fresh mind. And, and I'm always afraid something will come up, especially I wrote most of them when I was teaching full time and grading tons of papers all the time. I can't even imagine how I did that. I don't know now, either. You know, I can barely get four cats fed and, and have time <laughs> to write. So, <laughs> so oh, yeah. it's fear in a way, you know, and then, and then anything else that comes up, the writing always gets put in back because that's what I hate doing the most. I know. I, I like it when it's finished, but I just hate doing it. It's, you know, like pulling teeth. Well, in my case, it's it's sort of the opposite. I want to do the writing, but there's all this other stuff that not just the stuff of daily life, but it's as you know, when a book comes out, there's it's not just oh, my book is out. I'm going to sit back and have a beer. No, <laughs> no, especially in this in these days when when you don't have uh, tens of thousands of dollars uh, budgets to promote and and market, and and basically the, the the burden falls on the author. So it's like before the book comes out, when the book is out, after the book is out it's just work 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 you know getting the word out promoting talking to people interviews uh, it just doesn't seem to end so that's when I find the writing just keeps going to the back sometimes uh, by the time I'm starting to write it's two in the afternoon already because I'm so busy doing all this other stuff for the beginning of the day and that's that to me is the biggest frustration but yeah. it is what it is <laughs> well I was spoiled because the internet wasn't up and running like it is now the first three books that I wrote. So I didn't have to do anything. I just um, gave them the books, had book tours, ate luxuriously, stayed in great places. <laughs> oh, those were the days. Tours. You know, it was, it was really, it was just fun after the book was finished. And then since I didn't have any deadlines, I didn't really worry about the next book. I, I mean, I was teaching and, and trying to just work it in there. Um, I did take a couple years off teaching after Miami Purity just to write and hang out. But thank God I went back to the full time teaching because then I didn't have to, you know, struggle with all this stuff. And and I'm just not a good publicist. I just can't do that. You know, that's really what it takes now. And that's probably why I'm not writing very much, because I I know it's not going to go anywhere if you don't have a Facebook presence and a, a Twitter presence. And I just can't get myself to do that. I thought when I retired from teaching, I would, but I just stopped altogether, basically. <laughs> It's it's a lot of work. I mean, it really is. Social media has become another job. And I do consider this a job. And, and you know, people make fun of you. Oh, you know, you're just on Facebook all the time. But, you know, it's, and it isn't just constantly banging people on the head about buy my book, buy my book, because after a while you don't hear that message. But it's 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 kind of just just making yourself approachable and making people like, oh, that's funny what happened to you or, or all oh, that picture is really a scream. And, and, and just sort of uh, almost that personal approach that gets people saying, you know, I like this person. I, I think she's kind of cool. I'm going to go check out the books and, you know, buy some books. And, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where it's at right now because everybody's screaming the same message on Twitter and buy my book, buy my book. And, and you don't hear it anymore because there's just so many people with the same message. So. Yeah. Yeah. You have to kind of almost like you have a big circle of friends, like thousands of friends. It's really what it's like. I think I I was kind of lucky going, well, lucky and unlucky. Going into noir, there are very few female noir writers. So, you know, when a collection comes out, they have almost all men that want to write for it. And then they have to scramble to find some women. So. Yeah often find me <laughs> yeah so yeah there's that but then noir is one of the least popular genres you know it just it has fans that are crazed for it but then most people just really don't like it that well you know it's i don't know why i've asked myself this for years i don't either but, but probably something to do with the characters they want nice people they want to live in the brains of nice people, not maniacs. That's boring. I would, I would much rather, yeah, live in a maniac brain. 
But and lots going on. Yeah, lots of things happening in there. Well, it's it's like, you know, I'm a big fan of film noir. So, I mean, you know, I just totally, I just, I mean, I've got several classic films, uh, uh, Dark Passages, uh, uh, just film. I just love those. So, I mean, I don't understand how anyone wouldn't appreciate that. And uh, I mean, if true crime is as popular as it is, then I should think crime noir should be bumping up the ladder, you know? Yeah, yeah, that is, you know, true crime is by far. It's noir. Than <laughs> noir as far as Dark. real. So I don't know, I don't know. I guess you either have to really like that blood and gut stuff or or you don't like it and noir is somewhere in the middle, not not gathering much fame, I don't know. But there are so many definitions of noir also. If you broaden the definition, you can bring a lot of people in, but um, my stuff isn't really broad definition noir. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, 50 shades of noir, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody steal that title from me or I will sue. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm tired yeah. of having my work. I'm tired of being ripped off. I've had it. I'm, you're going to see me in a true crime book soon if you keep ripping me off. <laughs> um, um, so so uh, you actually um, did, you did write a book that's a departure from noir, though. You did your Fur People book, right? And that's not noir. Yes. Well, you know what? After I'd written it, I realized it is noir. <laughs> <laughs> I still got in there. It it. The thing it doesn't have is the really bad screw yourself into the ground ending. So in that way, it's not noir because noir really has to end badly. And <laughs> and this doesn't. But everything else about it is pretty noir. It's a down and out character with uh, her, oh, I forget how many animals she has, trying to feed them, living in a school bus out in the woods. Um, you know, she's... Uh, so worried about animals and even vegetables that she doesn't want to eat anything. So she tries to eat like white bread, you know, the thing that looks least like it could have ever been alive. No and, smile on it. Yeah. Don't eat anything yeah, without, but, with a smile. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, she doesn't want to eat a carrot because it's probably painful for the carrot. So, you know, she's just, she has nowhere to turn really. And, and, so she's struggling and meets a homeless guy and you know they kind of get along and and but he's crazy so you know it's it's just really a rough <laughs> ride and there are crimes there's no murder though which noir i guess has to have murder although my book voluntary madness just had a manslaughter and they called that noir so yeah i don't know but um, but that's legal terminology. So yeah, yeah. But um, you know, there are animals who die, so that's not good. And and no, there are that's animals. never good. I mean, everything she's doing is illegal, so that's the crime part. But but it is a lot different from noir. I just didn't realize how many noir notes were creeping in there. there was a gun also. <laughs> Well, I guess it's, you know, it's in the blood, noir in the blood. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. so, I mean, your character is in a way a bit, a bit like yourself because you are also uh, someone who's been involved in animal rescue with the kitties and the feral kitties. I remember in when you were living in South Florida, you used to um, help out the, the feral kitties who lived at the beach, right? Yeah, I used to feed there and sometimes help trap, but mostly feed. Um, go over there in the morning, there were some wooded areas in between the parking lots and there were actually, it was called Cat Pals. I think there is still in existence, but um, they were told to get all the cats out of there at some point, no more feral cats in um, the parks. And you know, that was a big problem, but that was right as I was moving. I think maybe some people are still carrying on with that, but you know, we fed them every day and they got into the vets and they all got neutered and spayed and um, they were really well taken care of. So um, they lived to be 16, some of them. And, you know, then, that's amazing. Um, many, many of them got adopted out and, and then somebody else took the ones that just weren't friendly enough to go to homes. So I think it, it pretty much came out all right. But, you know, people are always um, really 
perturbed about having feral cats around the people that don't take care of them or, you know, and, and it's all because people don't get their cats spayed and neutered. And, and then they wonder why all these cats are all over the place. Yeah. So, so I go out now and, and living out in the country, it's much worse. I think, I don't know, in cities, it's bad too, but you know, you'll go and people are feeding 70 cats and, and, you know, half of them are still having babies or, you oh, know, God. you just whittle away. And um, the county, Volusia County, has a really good program for um, spaying and neutering where you can take them in and and they do it, give them their shots. You know, it's really great. I'm sure it's made a big difference. It's just hard to tell because there are so many, you know, cats and the thing is, people can take them in, too, you know, if they get a trap, but people don't have traps and people have to work. And, you know, so a lot of us volunteers try to, you know, um, take the burden off of some people by taking the cats in for them that can't afford to buy $500 worth of traps and and everything that goes with it and, and put in the time to drive them over there and pick them up and, and everything. So hope I don't get too many calls. But <laughs> Well, I think I think people like you are heroes. I mean, I'm a I'm a big uh, I'm a big animal advocate, and I, you know I try to uh, you know get word out, cross post. I donate when I can, and I will tell you right now, my in my will, everything goes to animal rescue. Not one person is in my will, and I hope I have something left for them to get. So, <laughs> because, I mean, you know, I I just like I. People are the problem, not the animals, and, and we need to remember that. People, people are the scourge here, and and it's the fault of people that we have these animals that are out there and and not being helped and and not being you know in a nice loving home and being taken care of. So I mean, you know, that's where the responsibility is, and and we've seen it even worse right now, you know. So yeah, I, a lot of people are adopting animals right now, which is really good. But I hope when they go back to work, it doesn't become a problem. Yeah, yeah, I know that's that's been a lot of the dialogue in the rescue community as well. That well, oh no, I have to go back to work. I don't have time for Fido. You know? Yeah, or he's not yeah. properly trained, and then he can't get a, another home either, or you know, left to home, left home alone, chews up everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, people look after your pets and do everything you can for the animals. It's your responsibility, and you need to be like Vicky and and all the good people that help animals. Oh, I, I had nine cats at one time when I was in my 20s. And, oh, and wow. looking back, I could have done a lot better. I'm not, you know, I really, huh, you know, I couldn't afford to have nine cats right now because they need so many shots and they need all the flea control. And they, you know, back then it was more just winging it. And <laughs> I'm sure that it wasn't the best job I could have done. And, and I was reliving some of that when I was writing for people and, you know, thinking about her and that school bus with all the cats and, and remembering, you know, having too many. But How many kitties do you have now? I only have four. Oh, only four. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, they're very well taken care of. Um, cost me a fortune taking care of. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, for people who don't have, a lot of money, you know, there's help if you look for it, you know, you know, like you said, the county or yeah. rescues and whatever. I mean, even, even uh, uh, people who have to get some medical treatment and, you know, there's fundraisers, people, people will cough up money to help you. You know, I mean, I've seen it time and time some, again. Some really around here, there, there is not that much, you know, to help people. I mean, the vets are so expensive now, you know, you just, you know, $65 to walk in the door and, and people don't have that kind of money. Get a cat fixed, 200, $250, you know, and, and people just can't do that. So I don't, you know, you can't tell the vets that they can't make money either, but I don't know what you can do. It's, it's, it really seems like the more we find out about how much animals need, you know, the least, the less people can afford to keep them. So I, I you know, it's just a big problem. But well, people can't afford to get health care either. So it's sort of like what else right, is new? Right. Yes. Yeah, just part of the course the in America. And, Yay. You know, there's probably something wrong with me, but <laughs> I, yeah, can't I can't afford them. to go. <laughs> yeah. The animals yeah. are so innocent. You know, that's why you have to worry about them. 
Exactly. Uh, exactly. I don't know. Do you want to talk about any more book stuff? I, I end up talking about animals forever. I also volunteer <laughs> at, at the Center for the Great Apes, but I'll try. They're closed oh, right now, of course. I remember your ape story. You wrote this story for my book, Dying For It, Tales of Sex and Death, oh, and it yeah. had a, a, an ape in that. That was quite a story. I, I fear looking back at that because now I know so much more about apes. I wonder how much I got wrong. I don't really want to know. It's <laughs> fiction. It's monkeys, fiction. Though. There was only yeah. one chimp in there. The rest were monkeys. So yeah, it was just one pervy ape. It's it's just that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was oh. pretty pervy. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry. You know, you need to. You need to. You know. Um. I. I mean. So you're not actually working on anything, any new projects right now or a story for my next book either, right? Um, I'm working on a novel, but I'm on a break right now. <laughs> oh, another one of those six months breaks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was really kind of into it. And then, I don't know, um, the COVID, you know, hit. And I don't know, it just threw me off. It was like, I don't have anything to do, but I don't know when I will have something to do. So therefore... I can just put this off and I know I'll have time to get back to it. And then before you knew it, I had put it off too long and now I have to start over again. But it's uh, uh, it's the fall of the House of Usher, um, short story made into a book with gay characters in, and the house is in Key West. Oh, and, as it would be. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot in there about architecture and stuff that I know very little. So I've had to do a lot of research for it. I'm 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 within a few scenes of finishing it, but I just stopped and now I have to go back and I think it needs some filling out along the way also. So I'm not sure when I'll get back with that, but hopefully sometime. Yeah, well, I mean, when you have a deadline, that's, you know, I mean, every time I've got a book contract, there's a deadline, and then I've got to go and breathe down everyone else's neck as well, saying, look, I'm waiting on your story, you sent me the proposal, is it coming in? You know, so it's like, I keep telling people, send as early as you can to my submission calls, because I don't want to spend the last two weeks absolutely in agony from trying to craft this whole book together and checking on everyone's facts and and editing and going back if i need to revising and so yeah it, the deadline it's inevitable you're going to do that it's inevitable well i know because it keeps <laughs> happening with every book <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like I need, you know, and then I tell my publisher, hey, a couple more weeks, a couple more weeks. You know, I've even had people on the day of the final days, like the deadline is today. I'd get an email like that day saying, I just saw your call and I have this idea for a story. And sometimes it's such a blow your mind idea that I say, okay, let me see what I can do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fortunately, it's worked out so far, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I'm so glad you were able to come on and chat with me from, from sunny Florida. And uh, you need to read uh, Vicki's story, Booksom Bell, Her Own Story, in the best new true crime stories, Serial Killers. And it was it was lovely to see you again. And we, maybe we'll meet for a mojito again in, in I know futuristic time. <laughs> yeah, well, we're in a very futuristic time. I think I know. I to some normal time a little bit you know yeah, having yeah. Mojitos in a real bar <laughs> yeah yeah without wearing a hazmat suit and trying to get the mojito straw <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure something will be invented soon that makes it easier i, I certainly hope so a, a british guy with a thing that flaps up you know it has a uh, bluetooth thing that connects um somehow with your when you lift your arm on your watch and it makes the flap go up so you can drink and then it comes back down. <laughs> it was British, of course. You know the Brits. <laughs> I do indeed. <laughs> I say I'm officially one myself, so. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, which reminds me, I need to renew, renew my passport. Not that I'm going anywhere, but I need to renew it. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, you know, it's when you, when it expires is when I'll need it. So I don't want to wait that long. <laughs> So, nice. well, listen, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, say hi to Thank the kitties you. and say hi to your gentlemen. Okay. All Thank right. Thank you so much for having me. And I will tell people to go on and watch us. Thank <laughs> you. And, and to buy the book.
that too. That's the most that important. No used copies. On and do, watch. Yeah, don't mm -hmm. buy a used copy. Never do that to an author because we do not earn any money off of a used book. So I discourage that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> and no, and no, no dodgy downloads. No pirated books because you, that's taking the money off, uh, money out of our pocket and out of a lot of people's pockets. You know, from everyone who works at the publishing company. So no pirated books. No used books. <laughs> Brand okay. new, clean, virus-free copies of oh, Light. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. Great okay. to see you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.